you can have all the best processes, systems, technology. Uh, you can do all the right things from a structural standpoint, but if the cultural elements are not in place, it's essentially all for naught. Because at the end of the day, it's people that are left to implement and make things happen. And if the culture is not aligned and people don't really understand what the core values are and how they fit into the big picture and where they're going, it doesn't all happen. This is the ERP Organizational Change Journal podcast, brought to you by Nestle and Associates, a Newport Beach, California-based ERP organizational change management firm serving the private equity industry. The ERP OCJ seeks to share expertise, insight, experience, and research, and to create effective conversation to help guide ERP organizational change to real, measurable, and verified success. And now, here's your ERP expert and host, the founder of Nestle & Associates, Dr. Jack Nestle. Hello everyone, Jack here. In this episode, we're diving to the mechanisms that drive success in private equity firms. We'll explore cutting edge strategies for sustainable growth, how to effectively lead through transformational changes and the critical role of digital evolution in private equity. This episode is a must listen for C-level executives, private equity professionals, and anyone involved in the PE ecosystem who's looking to sharpen their strategic edge and lead their organizations toward a prosperous future. And to guide us through this exploration, we're joined by an impressive of guest, Kit Lyle. Kit stands as a pivotal figure in the private equity landscape, renowned for his significant contributions to strategic growth and digital transformation. He's not just the founder of the Operators LLC, a dynamic community for PE-backed executives, and the Strategic Growth Council, but also the driving force behind Eclero Growth Partners. Under his leadership, Eclero, based in Washington, D.C., has become a beacon of clarity and strategic support for PE firms, investment banks, and portfolio companies, particularly in a middle market M&A ecosystem. Kit's approach is distinguished by its blend of qualitative and quantitative research, providing deep insights into market trends and competitive dynamics. This method has proven invaluable in guiding both investment and business decisions. His dedication to fostering a culture of collaboration among executives and his pursuit of growth and development in the private equity sector are what made Kit an exceptional source of wisdom for our listeners. So without further ado, from Southport, North Carolina, Kit, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Jack. It's good to be here. Well, hey, uh, Kit, before we dive into the heart of today's conversations, I'd love to hear more about your journey and experiences. Could you share um, and further introduce yourself to our listeners, perhaps sharing some highlights and insights from your career? Sure. Uh, my professional career began as a military intelligence officer in the U.S. Army. And, um, you know, I learned a lot there that, believe it or not, <laughs> was very applicable in business strategy. Um, so I was able to leverage the, the military experience and get a, a role in strategy consulting. And the work that I did there, we were focused on corporate, but there were a few private equity clients. And what I really liked about the private equity clients is that they would challenge me and push back and ask, uh, Kit, would you do this deal? In the cases in which I said yes, they might say, well, why? Uh, and then I would say something and they would say, why? And then they would say, well, would you invest your own money in this deal? And then they would say, why? You know, and so it was, it was really exciting for me. And so I, I got a lot more, enjoyed a lot more the private equity work than the corporate work. So I guess almost 25 years ago, I founded Aclero Growth Partners. My intent, Jack, was to focus on the operators, to focus on private equity backed executives. Um, but in reality, <laughs> the traction was with private equity deal teams. And despite a lot of you know, enthusiasm and passion and interest and effort, the proportion of work that Aclero did and does with operators really never changed that much. It was always been about 20, 25% of revenue. So I hired a CEO to run that consulting business a few years ago, which freed up me and my time and I've always had this, this interest and curiosity and sort of um, acknowledgement that, you know, at least in my mind, the operators are the, the elite professional athletes of the business world. They go through a lot of turmoil and stress and challenge, and yet somehow they often seem very, very humble and modest. And I, I admired that. And I uh, admired the, the impact that they're able to have on businesses in a short period of time. So 
uh, that led me to start reaching out to them as I sort of explored the idea of a community for operators. So I'll share the quick process and then I'll, I'll see if you have any questions, Jack. The, sure. the process began with reaching out to individuals one at a time on LinkedIn, individuals who self-described as a private equity backed executive. And I simply asked a series of, you know, what now in hindsight seems like some naive questions, you know, <laughs> it, why is there not an association of operators? What about a professional society? I can't find even a, a club or a community. Wouldn't it make sense for you to collaborate, ask questions, share wisdom and insights, find best practices, um, you know, help one another out? Uh, or maybe maybe I'm missing something. Maybe it already exists, or maybe you uh, don't want it, don't need it. That message seemed to generate a, a tremendous response. And if I remember correctly, it was a unanimous response in that everyone I reached out to said, no, you're onto something. This makes a lot of sense. We need yeah. it. We want it. Absolutely. It's not exist. You know, make it happen. Well, Kit, that's fascinating. And I want to dive more into that. Um, I do think that that's a, a great idea. And there's a need for that for sure. You know, surely there's different communities for deal making and, you know, they have visibility to deals and that sort of thing. But I think uh, that what you're describing to our listeners is unique and, and certainly value added for sure. Well, Kit, thank you again for joining us. Um, I'm really thrilled and honored to have you with us. I think your impressive track record as the founder of El Claro Growth Partners, the Operations LLC, uh, and the Strategic Growth Council gives you unparalleled expertise in strategic growth and digital transformation within private equity. And looking forward to discussing your insights, as I know they're incredibly valuable, especially for our listeners who are navigating the intricate dynamics of PE firms and portfolio companies. So I'm excited to share your wealth of knowledge and experience today. Uh, listeners, all of us here at the ERP OCJ hope you find this podcast useful as we share lessons learned, discover best practices, and explore the human element components of ERP organizational change. Our conversations on the ERP OCJ are built around the listen and learn approach. It's when you apply what you've learned that you begin to move the needle forward. So let's dive in. So Kit, I want to ask you a few questions along the idea of uh, you know strategies for sustained growth in private equity. And my first question is, based on your extensive experience, what are the key strategies for driving sustainable growth in PE-backed companies? That's a loaded yeah. question, but where would you start with that? It, it, it's a great question. And I'm going to answer the question by sharing with you and the audience uh, the fact that one of the four peer advisory groups that we host at the operators is called Strategic Growth Council. And we tackle this very topic. And in fact, we use uh, the case method of solving strategic growth dilemmas in portfolio companies. And one of the cases that we processed as a group, as a group of peers, had to do with the topic of culture and human capital alignment as the first critical step in the process of uh, driving growth of value creation in portfolio companies. And as a result of that case, we've had a couple of expert speakers come to the group and talk with us about human capital alignment and the, the importance of culture. And, you know, what, one of the things that I've learned is that you can have all the best processes, systems, technology, uh, you can do all the right things from a structural standpoint, but if the cultural elements are not in place, it's essentially all for naught. Because at the end of the day, it's people that are left to implement and make things happen. <laughs> and, yeah. and if the culture is not aligned and people don't really understand what the, the core values are and how they fit into the, the big picture and where they're going, it doesn't all happen. So in the Strategic Growth Council, we identified as a group roughly a dozen levers or value creation strategies. And the very first one is just that. It's that human capital cultural alignment. And I could go on if you'd like. I mean, I can share, I could rattle off the other ones because you said, what are the key strategies for driving sustainable growth? And, and um, yeah. you know, it's not limited yeah. to one. 
Would you like me to go on, Jack? Actually, yes, I would. Um, let me ask you a couple of questions. I think that that's, that's super critical. What you're saying there is the idea with the Strategic Growth Council and putting together these 12 value creation strategies. And as you'd mentioned, Kit, it starts with human capital alignment and the importance of culture as the first step. And you know, I think that's critical. And making the assumption that you have the proper human capital alignment and you have a healthy culture which is another, I mean, that's probably another conversation kit, uh, an hour conversation just on that topic alone. But how important is the alignment of not just the people, the human capital alignment, but how important is the alignment of the people, the processes and the technology in successful PE firms and what role does that alignment play in growth? So, So basically, I want to take my first question and expand on that. And the first part is human capital alignment. But then what is the value in making sure that your processes and your technology are aligned with the people and the culture to support the success? It's critical, extremely important. And, you know, in fact, um, I sort of misspoke because the first step is maybe a given to some folks, but rather than starting with the human capital and culture within the portfolio company, the first step is really ensuring that there is communication and alignment on the investment thesis from the board. Mm -hmm. So you really have, you know, a mandate from the board. This is the expectation. This is where we're going. And then it's up to management to kind of weigh in with, is this possible? Is this real? And it's an ongoing dialogue and communication. So I sort of left that, that part of the process out. Then you get into the culture piece and then In many uh, portfolio companies, particularly in the lower middle market to middle market, it may be the first institutional capital and there may not be the the systems, the processes, the technologies even in place at all. And the management team that is in place, this sounds very pejorative and and sort of a overgeneralization perhaps, but in many cases, the management team needs to be professionalized. And so... The second step, therefore, is um, improving human capital talent with new hires uh, and or doing assessments on the existing talent. The next step after that is what you are alluding to, the alignment of processes, systems, technology, and the, the assurances that the human capital piece connects with each of those. In other words, people understand why and where and how and what. Uh, they're responsible for and how it all ties together. You know, Kit, one of the things that can often be a buzzword, uh, two things that we've that we've been speaking about so far in this conversation, uh, one is culture, organizational culture, and the other one is people, processes, and technology, right? I mean, you hear that a lot. And I think that, and the reason I say they're a buzzword is I, I think they are to a certain degree. But the value of those ideas is is incredible. And one of the things that we've seen, and I'd be curious to get your thoughts, and I would say two things when it comes to organizational culture. We've seen anecdotally and just through conversations with other PE executives and portfolio executives that there has become more attention on organizational culture over the last few years, uh, number one. And number two, that there is a separation of portfolio executives when it comes to organizational culture. In other words, some of them, it could perhaps be more of a buzzword and they don't pay much attention to it and they think it's important, uh, but they don't quite uh, you know, spend the attention and time it may deserve to ensure that you have a healthy organizational culture. So right. um, I'm going to stop there. I don't know if that was more of a question or a statement, but what, what's your thoughts on, on those ideas? Well, I completely agree with what you said, and and you know I'll go one step further. I would say there is not only is there more emphasis being placed on the role of culture and aligning the the human element before thinking about systems, processes, technology, reporting, etc. But in addition to that, I think I sense that in the private equity sponsors, you know, at the board level. There's more of an acknowledgement that the human element, you know, is more than just uh, accounts, uh, is more than just payroll and benefits. Um, And so you see the rise in some private equity firms of the chief people officer or the chief human resources officer. And in some cases, I think they're just there for hiring purposes. But in many cases, it's it's 
an acknowledgement that the role of culture, human capital alignment in a portfolio company and across the portfolio has merit, has value, is worth looking at. You know, historically, I think there's been a dearth, a scarcity of respect for human resources, human capital, culture. It's like, uh, it's it's not quantitative. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. it's like the icky soft stuff, and uh, you know, like marketing, it doesn't gain the respect amongst financial analysts or you know, ex Wall Street types uh, that that make up the bulk. You know, ex bankers that make up most of the the ranks of uh, at least deal teams in private equity. Did that make sense, Jack? It did. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Kit, one thing I want to ask you, and I'm, I'm going to uh, put you on the spot because I like case studies, but just generally here, we don't need details, uh, but could you share with our listeners an example of how strategic planning for human capital alignment has significantly impacted a portfolio company's performance? Do you have any example that you can share uh, with our listeners? Just uh, share a quick story. Yeah. I mean, you know, sometimes the, the process of strategic planning seems rote and boring and sort of, you know, everybody thinks of, okay, we're going to go to an offsite retreat and, you know, we're going to use a, a process or a formula or a guide who's going to put us through an effort. And at the end of this, we're going to have a, li- a list of, uh, of tactics or next steps. And it's in many cases, I think the, the reaction that people have to a strategic planning process is, you know, what's really going to change? How's this going to impact me? We've done this before. But I think, A, in private equity, there's just not a huge amount of time to make change happen. Yeah. And so it, it, everything just is on a different level of urgency, number one. And number two, in some cases, that process of strategic planning has tremendous revelations. And, um, you know, those what is revealed in some cases is that the original, remember I talked about the original given as the investment thesis. Yeah. In some cases, you can acknowledge or realize or come to agreement amongst the management team that the the whole premise of the investment thesis is, you know, is on faulty footing and really does not hold merit. In some cases, that might mean that the sellers sort of misrepresented reality. In some cases, it might mean the due diligence didn't take place very well, didn't happen very well. In some cases, it might mean that the operating partner's experience that was being leveraged was not as relevant as everyone thought. But regardless of the reason behind that, what often happens in strategic planning, in my experience with private equity owned portfolio companies, is a significant shift happens. So the example that you know comes to mind is there was an acquisition that was going to be happening, and we were doing strategic planning around that, around that acquisition, the implications of that acquisition. And, you know, questions come up inevitably, and sometimes questions result in the need for more data and an and analysis around that. And in this particular case, that data revealed that the, the strategy was completely misguided, to put it simply. So what the result of the strategic planning session was not your ho-hum <laughs> standard, here's what we're going to do and here's how we're going to do it and here's the timeline and here's the metrics and here are the champions and so forth, but rather it was sort of turning the company in a whole new direction as a result of as a result of the fact that, you know, by definition, strategic planning means bringing a, a number of wise voices to the table to be heard. Yeah. So, um that's, I'm, I'm not sure if that was as crystal clear or poignant. I didn't get into the details, but hopefully that suffices. Jack, what do you think? Yeah, no, that that was great, Kit. Thank you. Yeah, no, great, great answer and, and great insight. I appreciate it. Uh, and certainly this idea of a different level of urgency, which I want to ask you about here in a, uh, in a few minutes. I want to dig into that just a little bit more, uh, but that couldn't be uh, any more true. Um, but in your perspective, Kit, what are some of the emerging trends, uh, whether it's people, process, or technology in the PE sector that firms should be aware of to stay competitive? Uh, is there anything you see? I, I know we talked about kind of the the change or the trend over the last few years with perhaps more, more focus on organizational culture. Yeah. Um, but what are some of the other things you can share with our listeners that maybe you see as a trend that, that our listeners should be aware of? in terms of staying competitive, whether it's people, processes, or tech? Well, I mean, I think that's a really good segue, 
from what I was, the point that I was making with regards to the strategic planning, because one mm -hmm. of the big trends, particularly at the lower end of the middle market um, that I see occurring is the, the existence of the annual summit. Mm -hmm. At the upper end of the middle market, you know, this has been going on for years. The larger private equity firms can justify having um, an offsite for several days of not only the CEOs, but CFOs, COOs. Maybe they'll have a COO summit separately, um, mm -hmm. maybe a CMO summit separately. Um, sometimes they bring them all together. And the reason that I say that this is an emerging trend and the reason that it matters is when you bring people together to collaborate, share wisdom, ideas, best practices, you know, an opportunity to solve dilemmas that are being faced in one portfolio company, there is inevitably benefit that comes from what I call cross-pollination. Yeah, in other words, absolutely. if you've got a variety of different roles coming together to brainstorm, you know, outside of the confines, the cozy confines of their their office, their company, their industry, their customers, their competitors, and suddenly you bring them together to brainstorm on, you know, just trends in technology, <laughs> trends generally. How is this impacting our portfolio? What should we be doing differently? Hey, here's a problem I'm facing in my portfolio company. How are you handling that? There's benefit in having that cross-pollination across roles, but yeah. also cross-pollination across industries. So one of the, the reasons that I you know, I'll use the word love, that I love the Strategic Growth Council is it's essentially just that. It's sort of its own little microcosm of the concept of the offsite, the summit, the sea level summit. So that's maybe it's not an emerging trend, but I think it has tremendous implications for private equity. Um, and I'll just finish that with a final thought. You know, just the idea that a private equity fund is not does not exist solely to ensure return on invested capital for the LPs, but rather has maybe a different purpose, an, an additional purpose, and that might be enabling portfolio companies to make better, more efficient, more effective strategic decisions as a result of you know harnessing or cultivating the power, the experience, the wisdom, the insights that exist yeah. within that cadre of portfolio company executives. So bringing them together for strategic planning makes a lot of sense. And thankfully, it's it's taking root. Yeah. Well, Kit, I really love the idea and the purpose of the Strategic Growth Council. And I agree. I, I think it's a very, very powerful uh, idea. And, you know, for one, it inspires reflection and learning. And, you know, I think that especially for, for leaders of organizations where the, you know, really the organization is relying on your leadership and guidance, you know, I think we call it collaborative learning, uh, which right. is, which frankly is the purpose of this podcast. Uh, One hundred percent. The purpose of this podcast is to share and learn from different disciplines and different fields and, and different people on how to you know contribute to organizational performance. You know, at the end of the day, and this idea that you'd mentioned of harnessing and leveraging wisdom through collaborative learning is a very powerful idea. You know, Kid, I, I know that you know private equity and obviously an acquisition from a seller to buyer. Uh, there's a lot going on there, right? And and it's not always easy, especially when there's a, as you described earlier, different level of urgency. You know, I, I think the PE environment is a little bit different there because there there absolutely is a different level of urgency. And um, so I just want to ask you a few questions regarding uh, leading through change and maybe provide some additional insights for PE executives. Sure. So in, in your role as a guide for C-level executives, what have you identified as the most critical factors in leading a PE firm or portfolio company through change? What's some of the first things that come to mind from your experience? Well, you know, when we think about the word change, change essentially means there are unknowns, there are blind spots, it's a, a, a new world, there's something that, that is different. And if we dive deeper into, you know, how you handle change, really, it, it, it involves the simple term research, right? So I'll, I'll leverage uh, my experiences with Aclero Growth Partners in saying that in periods of change and uncertainty um, and evolution, revolution, 
um, it behooves you as a portfolio company, C-level executive to gain fresh new insights, to challenge conventional wisdom, and to avail yourselves of everything that you can in a relatively short period of time with a relatively small budget of market, customer, competitor, supplier, that in other words, anything that's external to your company, because you probably know what the realities are internally, but you don't have any way of really harnessing what has happened externally until you dig in. So I'll give you a few examples from a market standpoint, what's happened with growth? You know, what is the growth rate? How does it vary by segment? What are some trends and drivers that are impacting growth? Uh, what are the critical success factors in that market? Or how does it vary? How do opportunities and threats and challenges vary by segment? What has this change impacted? Uh, the, the, how has it impacted the market? From a customer standpoint, you know, how has it impacted? How has this change or, or, or what's new with regard to the way customers make purchase decisions? What do they value? What are their unmet needs? Uh, what is their proclivity to pay more to solve those needs? And from a competitive standpoint, you know, maybe it's just understanding how competitors are selling themselves, what they're labeling their strengths, um, what the direction is that they're going, you know, what, what they're selling them themselves on. It could be that a competitor is driving themselves off a cliff, you know, promoting something that customers care nothing about. Um, knowing that in this time of change, enables you to make more effective strategic decisions for your own company. So my, my recommendation there is just be aware of what's changing outside of your company. Yeah. Yeah. Great insight, Kit. And I like how you said that there are blind spots, you know, in these acquisitions and, and uh, that's an understatement <laughs> to say the least. And, you know, I, I think it's how you react to the unknowns and the blind spots that is crucial. You know, as you'd mentioned, there's investment thesis and there's strategic plans and those are great. But as uh, who was, I think it was Mike Tyson once said, everyone has a plan until you get punched in the face. Okay. And, and so, you know, I, I think that, that that experience happens on almost every single acquisition. And so leading through the unknown, not just through the known, is, is crucial. So great point, great insight. Um, Kit, how do you recommend PE firms balance the traditional investment strategies with innovative approaches in today's market? You know, when you look back at the just traditional investment strategies around what PE firms look for uh, pre-acquisition, you know, you talked earlier about the value of proper due diligence. Uh, clearly, that's right. key. And I think we've both probably seen, uh, having spent years in private equity, that, uh, you know, sometimes the, the due diligence, you know, is a bit weak and, and that can catch up to you later, you know, in the investment cycle. But uh, there's these different strategies. And now you see more like just to give you an example with what I would think is more of an innovative approach is, is the idea of some of the things you talked about with your framework around aligning people, processes and technology or kind of this trend around yeah. organizational culture. And in fact, hit, you know, again, just anecdotal experience, but it's factual, right? It, experience on our part is definitely PE firms are spending more time, even in a due diligence phase, trying to understand the organizational culture. Instead of post-acquisition, they're focusing more on it pre-acquisition. So right. with that in mind, is there just anything, and maybe there's nothing that comes to mind as far as you know what we would maybe call traditional investment strategies versus more innovative approaches in today's market. Is there anything else that comes to mind? You know, historically, if we go back 30 years, uh, private equity by definition was all about financial engineering, financial re-engineering. Yeah. And as it matured, some private equity groups differentiated themselves by saying, we're really interested in, you know, quote unquote, hairy deals. So we're looking for turnaround situations that where we can improve the operations. So you go from financial engineering to sort of operational engineering. And then later, private equity groups realized that they could bring on board operating partners with experience, knowledge, wisdom, insights in an industry. And so then, you know, as the, the private equity industry matured, you know, looking back perhaps 10 years ago, you saw the rise, uh, the, the, you saw the downturn of 
private equity groups that would define themselves as industry agnostic yeah. and the rise of private equity groups that focused on, you know, we're healthcare investors or infrastructure investors or what have you. Mm -hmm. And I'd say, you know, today there's a, a lot of interest in private equity groups taking a look at an investment thesis initially at a very high level. So I'll give you an example. We, we, um, Aclaro Growth Partners, had a client that was really consumed with the concept of industrial automation. But industrial automation is completely amorphous. In other words, there is not an industry NAICS code or SICK code for <laughs> industrial automation. What does it mean? How do you define it? Where, how do you put a border around it? You can't. So the work that we did, we call it the money ball approach. The money okay, ball yeah. approach is essentially taking an investment thesis or theme or idea like that. Hey, let's take advantage of the rising tide of aging baby boomers who are interested in health, wellness, and fitness. Well, again, <laughs> what does that mean? How do you do that? Right? So step by step by step, we developed a process at Aclaro Growth Partners to define those ideas, label them, give them order out of the chaos, and then essentially rank and prioritize those explicit segments that do exist underneath those big amorphous themes or ideas mm -hmm. yep. so that at the end of the process, you can say to the private equity investor, this specific segment that has a, a total market size of you know, $800 million is where you need to focus. And there are only 40 competitors in that space, but that's where, in other words, it's, it's handing the keys to business development originations and the deal team at a private equity group and saying, you should spend your time, energy, money, you know, at, at conferences, <laughs> at association events, and uh, and going on visits to companies in this specific niche sector. Why? Mm -hmm. Because the facts show growth, opportunity, size, return, you know, demand, need, you know, the change that's happening in that segment will result in rising tides in that segment more than more than in others. So I get pretty passionate about that. That's a great answer. <laughs> great example, Kit. I appreciate it. Um, pretty, uh, pretty interesting uh, approach. And that may be a, a topic. It's worth another conversation. You know, yeah. in that framework, that's very interesting. Kit, what would be your advice for PE executives to effectively harness the potential of their teams during periods of significant organizational change? And I know we kind of briefly touched on this uh, a little bit uh, earlier in the conversation, but if you could give me just one little tidbit of advice for PE executives on what would you see as being the most effective tool to harness the potential of their teams, especially during significant organizational change? Well, I would say private equity owners maybe do not acknowledge as much as they should the fact that the operators that they recruit in from General Electric or Dow or Microsoft or Google or wherever, uh, when they land at a PE-backed organization, they experience what I call private equity culture shock. Similarly, those executives who are incumbent members of the management team and used to report to a family business owner, you know, they wake up one day and suddenly they're reporting to a, a private equity board. Yeah. They yeah. experience private equity culture shock. Mm -hmm. In addition, as executives of any company, it's lonely at the top. And I think given the dramatic uh, expectations in terms of value creation in a very short period of time, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it suffices to say that PE-backed executives are under a tremendous amount of stress. And some of them even experience kind of a third uh, psychological state that I would call imposter syndrome. In other words, I've signed on to grow this company by 30% annual revenue. What have I gotten myself into? I, I can't possibly do this. I, I had no idea how, you know, unprofessional the management team would be or how, how they would lack systems and processes and technologies and capabilities. You know, what have, what have I done? So my answer to your question is 
I would encourage private equity groups to recognize what they're holding management teams accountable for and to realize that, you know, in these periods of uncertainty and change and chaos, it's convenient for them to say, well, if management can't figure them figure this out, if management can't grow this business, if management can't create value, we'll just fire them and bring in, you know, a management team that can. That's that's easy, but I would challenge them to realize that, you know, there's there's a little bit of an onus of responsibility to provide them with the tools to make change happen in the in the timelines that they have. And one tool that is readily available at their disposal is, as I said earlier, the power of peers, the power of the annual summit. But think of it as the power of the annual summit on an ongoing 24-7 basis. In other words, share, collaborate, answer, uh, help. <laughs> um, you know, I, I coach boys basketball and sometimes getting, in this case, sixth graders to realize that it's okay to leave your man and go help out somebody, <laughs> you know, help, help out to prevent, prevent that easy layup. And the same thing is here. You know, if, if you're doing your job at your portfolio company, but your cousin down the road, the, the other portfolio company needs help, you know, you should be able to weigh in and, and help. And I don't think private equity groups take advantage of that, take advantage of that institutional knowledge, wisdom, and experience that they have in their portfolio executives to the extent that they should. Yeah, that that's a awesome answer and very insightful and clearly coming from somebody that knows the the PE uh, world intimately. And I cannot even tell you how many times we have seen that and experienced that. And, you know, the idea of PE culture shock, which derives from value creation in a short period of time, I think that's wonderfully said. And I think you know, we've talked about that internally here at Nestle and Associates and done, you know, a little bit of, you know, some articles and research on that, actually, because I think that's a critical idea. And one, as you'd mentioned, one tool is the power of the peers and being proactive, honest and realistic, uh, you know, about the engagement, right, about the acquisition. And, and you know, I must say, um, I, I believe that there's some PE firms that understand that and value that idea, and there's some that don't. And we even have a current client, actually, that I think that they understand that idea so well that even during the due diligence process, there's things that you see them doing tactically to build that relationship with these management teams and start having these conversations around how are things going to change? What can they expect? And even in advance of, you know, signing on the line, right? But I think it's it's such a powerful insight uh, that, that you're sharing here with our listeners uh, today. Oh, thanks. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Kate, if you don't mind, I want to ask you one more question here. Actually, two more questions. Uh, I want to ask you one more question, and I definitely have to get your golden nugget. Um, and, uh, but I do appreciate your time. But if you don't mind, two more questions. But can you share, can you discuss the importance of building a culture of continuous improvement and learning in PE-backed companies? Right. It's it's one thing to get through that initial shock and that, that initial change. But, you know, really, at the end of the day, people ask me, what is the value of private equity? Why, why does the private equity industry exist? And for me, uh, I would say generally, it's to create a healthy, vibrant, successful company that's sustainable for years to come. And it takes care of its internal stakeholders, right? You build that culture, you build that organization, you put, yes, the processes, the people, the technology in place in a way that that organization is going to continue to be successful well after your investment in that organization ends. Um, that's my response. But can you discuss the importance of building a culture of continuous improvement and learning? And, and how do you ensure that that happens, not just initially upon the initial acquisition, but for years to come in a PE backed enterprise? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm going to have a, any, any pearly words of wisdom here, but I'll share with you just coincidentally, Jack, yesterday was the third Thursday of the month. And that is the date in which we have our strategic growth council meeting. And one yeah. of our executives yeah. uh, shared with the group his own case. And it was really fascinating. And I think it it sheds light on this topic. I'm not sure if I have a poignant um, you know, summary takeaway, but I'll share with you the discussion. So he's the chief strategy officer of a PE-backed organization. 
and is the senior most member of the management team who is an incumbent, which brings a wealth of you know knowledge, experience, insight about the industry, the company, the competitive dynamics, the product, obviously. So um, other members of the management team at a high level were, were uh, let go as part of the professionalization process, but he was, he was retained. And what he shared with the group is that there is an internal conflict. And I think that this, you know, I used the word microcosm earlier. I'll, I'll use it again. Um, this feels to me like a representative example of what happens in basically every portfolio company. The conflict between short term and long term and his loyalty and affinity for his company, his customers, their products and services um, long, long, long term. So he has a a, a a unique perspective on the what's the right word on the um, uh, heredity maybe <laughs> uh, of of the company and the mm-hmm. role that it plays in its market with its customers and then you've got an operating partner who has uh, what we'll call the long term view and then we've got a CEO who has you know the way he described it uh, as a short term view meaning the CEO's mindset is this business will be sold in, in the fourth quarter of 2024. And therefore, every decision, every strategic decision is fixated on you know, reducing costs and preparing for exit. Preparing for exit yeah. means a number of things, obviously. Yeah. Um, the operating partner had a longer term vision and view, and the, the chief strategy officer had this kind of world view, this 50,000 foot, you know, satellite view of, yeah. Hey, here's what's happening with our customers and in our industry. And, um, like I said, I don't, I don't know that I have any poignant observations or suggestions there, but it, it's maybe just the nature of private equity that, you know, culturally you, you have to balance this short term, long term view. And our recommendation, the way we processed this quote unquote case for that, chief strategy officer is to say, you need to take the bull by the horns. You need to take the reins. You are the connection between short-term and long-term and frankly, you know, satellite view. So uh, we gave him some specific steps, but anyway, that's my answer to your question. And that's a great answer, Kit. I, I really like that. And again, that goes back to my very first question when you talk about human capital alignment and investment thesis is really understanding that idea of short, long term view and satellite view. You know, certainly if you're not able to bridge those lenses, right, those perspectives, uh, you know, that can cause issues. So great insight. Well, Kit, uh, now I I really appreciate your time today. It's been a great conversation. And man, I would really love to get you back on and dive deeper into some of these topics that we've talked about today. And because I I really do think that that some of the things that you're just scratching the surface on here today and sharing with our listeners, it's just that it's scratching the surface, but there's so much, so much more to talk about that, that may be a little more subjective or uh, um, invisible uh, to most people, but yet they're they're crucial uh, for sure in success. But Kit, now I'd like to ask you for the golden nugget. Uh, given all that we've discussed today, could you briefly summarize the key takeaways uh, for our listeners and maybe just kind of summarize the one or two major points that you'd like to leave our listeners with today? Yeah, my, my word of the year is cross-pollination. And I, I believe that, that, you know, when you bring people together from different backgrounds, different roles, different industries that, you know, magic happens at least in the, in the process of solving strategic dilemmas. So we, we have four groups, strategic growth councils, one, uh, we have an independent sponsors council. They need to come together because independent sponsors by definition are sort of jacks of all trades and maybe masters at perhaps a third or half of the critical elements of success in private equity. So they need each other. They need wisdom and insights. They need to balance and mitigate their areas of weakness or or lack of knowledge or expertise. So there's the Independent Sponsor Council. Um, We have a Trusted Advisors Council, and I'd love to have you join us there, Jack, uh, in the Trusted Advisors Council. It's service providers that that are involved in the middle market M&A ecosystem, uh, serving private equity and portfolio companies. And, you know, they need help. They need wisdom and insights and solving dilemmas associated with selling into private equity. And last but not least, uh, the fourth of our peer groups 
is the Career Transition Council or Career Resource Council. And um, that Career Resource Council is what leads me to uh, the answer to your golden nugget question. What I would say is operators must have, at least in the back of their minds, on the day they receive a job offer, they need to be thinking about what will be my next private equity group? What will be in my next portfolio company? What will be my next role? And they have to start planning that career transition process that far out in advance because that far out is actually only about 36 months on average. Yeah, so it's right. really not that long. Yeah. But that's what the Career Resource Council is all about is providing a process, a strategy for career transition. And as I said, it starts pretty much the day you get your job because uh, you got to be thinking ahead about where you're going to go next. So there you go. Well, Kit, thank you very much. And uh, we would absolutely be honored to participate in your advisory group uh, for sure. That would be an honor. Well, as promised, that wraps up another insightful episode. Today, we've explored the multifaceted world of PE growth strategies, the nuances of digital transformation and organizational change. Kit Lyo brought us his exceptional expertise to the table, providing invaluable insights on sustainable growth, effective leadership in the face of change, and the crucial balance of people, processes, and technology in private equity. To our listeners, I encourage you to apply all that you've learned today, whether you're steering through complex M&A activities, embarking on digital transformation, or seeking to enhance your firm's strategic positioning, the wisdom shared in this episode can help move the needle forward. Staying informed and adaptable is the key to success. Thank you so much for your time today, Kit. I really appreciate it. I really do appreciate your dedication to your trade and to the success of PE firms and, and organizations. But before we go, can you tell our listeners how they can get in touch with you? Sure. Thanks, Jack. Appreciate it. Uh, Kit, K-I-T, at the operators.pe as in private equity and our website is theoperators.pe as well super thank you and we'll be sure to include that information in the show notes as well well kit thank you again my friend i really appreciate it uh, be well and we'll talk soon and sincerely would love to get you back on here soon and, and dive a little deeper into some of these uh, topics that we talked about today i'd enjoy it jack thanks all right you bet thank you Thank you for joining us for today's episode of the ERP OCJ podcast. This podcast is intended as a forum to study, share, and discuss ERP organizational change successes and challenges.